Oh, I know. Um, I didn't get a choice to talk. Kiri said you're talking, so that's why I'm here. Um, a bit about us. So she asked us to talk about our um, experiences from the narrow inroad burning and the move to the chaff decks. As Mark had mentioned earlier, we, um, the days and ourselves, we went to the chaff decks on the headers, um, basically probably filling in time until we get the confidence and the suppliers get the confidence. I'd say we'll end up with a mill style thing down the track. So, but this is certainly working well and well, from one year's worth of experience and talking to guys that have had them for a number of years, they're working well, the chaff decks or a weed line, whatever you want to do. They, we've heard the numbers, they all work well, whatever suits your system. And then we go on to what we call this weed lining. It just became pretty obvious this year when you had um, Weeds growing on this char on the chaff, on the tram lines. There were just lines of weeds, and you know it was just an opportunity to try and target those. So, from narrow windrow burning, which you've heard a bit about, the chaff decks to the weed line. And so, uh, yeah, it's Diane and I and Ryan, full-time employee, works with us on all these crazy ideas in our cropping program. Rough idea, sort of that 500 mil rainfall. Low pH, like they were getting down to very low four pHs before we all tweaked what was going on 25 years ago and started liming. Now we try to keep them up close to five pH. Uh, they get to about 4.7, 4.8. We'll throw a bit more lime on. Um, got some sodic clays. We've got one block we lease. It's just sodic red shit clay, and it's difficult. We lime it. We put gypsum on it, and it still frustratingly doesn't perform. But it's part of the system. So we're cropping 2,000 hectares, we do some contract farming as well, another 700 hectares where we do the full range, uh, everything from sowing, spraying, right through to harvest. We do a bit of additional uh, contract harvesting just in our spare time. Brian, <coughs> Brian takes a header out to days. Uh, we don't see him for about four or five weeks until they've um, got close to the end of their harvest, so that keeps him busy for a while. And our main crops are wheat, canola, some narrow leaf lupins, uh, Fave beans, that's this year's program, and there's usually a few field peas in there. So we're running about, uh, this year's the first year we've had, um, there's no wheat on wheat. It's 50% uh, cereal, and our only cereal is wheat. Um, and so we've got a bit over 25% canola, and just a bit short of 25% pulses, and uh, yeah, just the lupins and beans, and there's no brown in Europe. Except uh, when things get a bit wet or get a bit watered out in the pulses, um, or things turn to shit as they did last year, there was a fair bit of brown manure where they just watered out and got sprayed out. So, some of the key factors are the soils, and as I mentioned, like the fertility, basic liming, and um, structure. So, we've gone from a being CTF in our system, like on a three metre system, control traffic since. Uh, 2006, Kiralee actually sent me to a CDF conference in 2005 uh, with FarmLink to Gatton, Toowoomba, and the penny dropped, we came home and thought, well, we just sort of can't waste any more time, we've got to get this system happening, so CTF has certainly helped the structure, we're not driving on it, so we've got dedicated permanent tracks, which have been bare tracks for 10 to 11 years, then the last couple of years we've now moved into a disc seeder, and um, just trying to further improve that structure and that, um, yeah, as Greg was talking about, the aggregate stability, which I tell him he keeps banging on about aggregate stability, but uh, when you see it, I mean, even in the first year on some of that soda country, when we move from the time, even with narrow, narrow points and press wheels and going to the disc, it was just another level, even a new one, it was amazing. Uh, weed management, we've got plenty of weeds, but then we're, we're winning in a lot of areas as well, but, um, just trying to get your timing of your weed management, you're trying to you know, target the timing, the rate, the size. We don't always get it right, we get caught with frost and all the rest like everyone else, we have some blowouts. Uh, sowing time, we've been calendar sowing for probably nearly 20 years. It was probably harder before the CTF because you'd have um, you know, four seed beds, cloddy, dry and all the rest of it. And sometimes we had to pull up because it was just too dry, too rough, but uh, we have been 100% dry sown. And, uh, and now we can sort of pretty much sow by the calendar. We're sowing earlier with the disc because it's not only because we can with the stuff of retention in the system, but I think you need to, especially when you're sowing canola into, into wheat stubbles, which we, we still are at the moment. 
and um, oh, timely application and pesticides. And there's no livestock in the cropping system. We um, got completely out of stock, I think, in about 98 and haven't had them since. And most of you are aware of my thoughts on tune. Uh, so there's the system, three metre wheel centres, everything matches up, lines up. Uh, the chaser bin is the only thing that we do actually go off the tram lines to unload the chaser bin, but then it follows the tram lines the rest of the time. It'll all be on RTK, two centimetres since uh, 2006. Same permanent track since then. Sow and harvest and lime spreading or gypsum spreading, all done on 12 metres. Uh, we spray, we've got a lot of spray coops and our linkage spreader, they both run on the 24 metres. But our main sprayer and our belt spreader, which we can do uh, urea at 36 metres, both of those. So at the moment, we're just, yeah, year like this, we're using just every third run, that's good. Uh, the discs, we're running on a 308 millimetre, which was basically we worked around our air kit. We wanted 12 metre, 12 metre cedar and system, and it basically worked out with um, 39 times over 12 metres to give that approximate sort of a 12 inch metric system. And we've um, got the option for the time machine and the press wheels, which is on the same row spacing to try to inter row sew and all that, but um, you can't inter row sew the disc because it just goes where it likes. So we've got to look at steering the disc machine in the future to make it go where we want it. Which one? Major weeds, annual ryegrass, and we've got there some herbicide resistant, but when I think about that, I think most of the little buggers are resistant to something, so. Um, we've got to use all the tactics, all the chemicals, all the chemistry, and we've probably got to move to a bit like Mark, the Steve Day, their system, we've got to go to more of a double break. We're doing a good job in getting the, the numbers down in, say, our pulse crop or our canola crop, but those few survivors just build up again in the, in the wheat the following year, and if we've dropped the trefle out of the system with the disc machine, yeah, they're just going to sneak back up on us. So I think we'll probably need to go to, and we will next year, the double break, which is growing the canola after the pulses, probably after lupins, and perhaps after some of the beans. Anyone comes on the trip tomorrow, you'll see the uh, favour beans around the house and sheds there where we pull up. That was just a huge blowout of ryegrass last year. Wet year, wet winter, wettest September in 130 years. The ryegrass loved it and the wheat drowned. And that uh, was just a huge blowout. And so we've done everything we could this year in the favour beans to control the ryegrass. They're still survivors. And I think if we go back to a cereal next year, we'll just increase numbers too much. So I think we'll go back to a canola double break and get that system working. Uh, wild oats, we have got some herbicide resistance. We've sent some away over the years to um, Otsalis at uh, in South Australia and had them tested and they are still susceptible to the group, whichever they are, which is um, Atlantis. Atlantis still 100% susceptible to that. Uh, wild radish is becoming less of a problem. When I first left Ag College, which is frighteningly 30 years ago now, um, we had wild radish. A little case header, self-propelled header, a little case 660. Bloody petrol with its constant motor up the back there, which is a great thing, but anyway. We had wild radish patches when I first came home, so I don't think Brodel was around then, and, and certainly Eclipse wasn't. We had wild radish patches that you couldn't put the header through because you spent the next two hours pulling it out of the drum. So you went around the radish patches with that thing. But since I've sort of been farming that country on the, on the original family farm for probably seriously for the last 15 years, um, last year that block was in lupins. Uh, so wet, couldn't get the timing right, could not get any. Um, Apart from the simazine post sowing on those lupins, we did not get any brodal or eclipse or a mixture on for the radish. And I was worried that was another reason to consider the chaff deck, so we didn't want radish blowouts back in the paddock. And we crop topped all the lupins, which we do with all the pulses with Gramoxone. And it was from Greg's recommendation by Rick Rundle that we whack a bit of sharpen in with the Gramoxone just to make sure we get that seed coat on that uh, wild radish. Couldn't find any wild radish in the lupins, but I wasn't going to take the risk, so I sprayed the whole lot with gramoxone, which was going to happen anyway. The rye grass, couldn't see the radish, and um, there was not a plant there. So I'd say after 15 years of just targeting it with every chemical and mixing the chemistry and everything we've done, as if in the past, if you had grown a crop of lupins and not used an in-crop herbicide to control radish, it'll stick its head up every time. So. To not see a plant and not see a plant when you're spraying with a coop when you're 
driving up every day on maybe 24 metres, you feel fairly personal with the paddock when you're only on 24 metres and sitting up looking down on it. Uh, so yeah, so I think we've sort of nearly nailed the radish, but we're continuing to spray it as though it's radish country. So you, sp pardon me, you spray them for flea bone and thistles and other things. So a bit of Tigrex or a bit of LVE alloy, those sort of things, you can still pick up your radish you know, and your atrazines and your canola. We've got our sour thistles and flea bones and all that sort of usual rubbish coming in with more with the wetter summer, so we've just got to be diligent with the spraying them. So the narrow window burning, we went to that, so the aim is to reduce that weed seed bank. Um, we tried first tried window burning in canola back in March in the 2005. It was a suggestion of Greg's, one of these crazy ideas they were trying in the West, so we thought we'd have a crack at that. And it worked really well. We got a great hot March, good hot burn, did a great job. And we went off it for a little bit for a while, but then we got back in in 2013. We narrowed it up, made this, oops, sorry. And um, yeah, got the shoot made up just on the back of the um, John Deere rotary header, just narrowed it up, you know, about a 500 mil gap there. And um, yeah, we're going along well with that. Canola was our preferred one, as a few mentioned here before, like you get the, the fire gets away if you've got wheat stubbles and too much of a um, other stubble in the paddock. And we have burnt lupins and we have burnt wheat stubbles as well. Um, because I've got permanent bare tracks here on all the paddocks, we have up until recent years, permanent bare tracks and the idea of driving across all that on a motorbike or a ute to, um, to burn paddocks, rough as guts, drives you mad, too slow, why are we doing it, motorbike, had enough. So we come up with this crazy harebrained idea, I was talking to Mark Day on the phone one night, we have a few crazy ideas at times and we're talking about it and he sort of half mentioned, why don't we do something like this? And I said, yeah, well, so I got straight online, found this crazy old um, Gold Acres trailing sprayer. So we turned that into a narrow window burner. So we've got three gas burners across there. I won't mention any names because I didn't copy one, I copied a copy of one. Um, so there's a gas burner and a diesel tank on there. So that's run by a pressurised, um, so we're not pumping the liquid, we're doing it by pressure because it's from a foam market tank. So there's one burner out here, gas burner, and it's on a solenoid, another one in the middle, and another one over there. So we're burning three rows at once, so we're effectively covering 36 metres at a time. But the trick was, you only need, from there to there's 12 metres, from there to there's 12 metres, you only needed a 24 metre sprayer to cover effectively that 36 metres, you didn't need a 36 metre rig. So you can crank along with that, and die would be down here somewhere in the smoke, and Ryan's probably over here watching the other boundary in the smoke, and I'm here in air conditioning and CDF, bloody radio going, tweeting flat out, and uh, yeah. <laughs> so that's why we went to burning. That was pretty good. Like you could knock over sort of 70, 60, 70 hectares in about an hour. You could just motor along about 18, 20 k's an hour. Had it, set, had it fully electronic, we made up a magic box for it. I had a crazy idea in my head, which is why I don't sleep some nights. Matting managed to convey that idea and a bit of chalk on the, on the workshop bench to Ryan. He actually made up the magic box with bloody switches and dials and uh, time delay. So we could time the length of drop, the distance between the drops, so we weren't lighting the whole, whole way. We're trying to simulate running across these, these rows. So we drop one down here, and there was one way back down there and then we could regulate where the next one drops sort of thing. So we're dropping along the road but travelling with them rather than trying to bloody run across it and shake yourself to bits. And that's just a rear view out the back of it. Uh, yeah, when things lock on and stay on, she's like a big flamethrower. <laughs> we avoided near misses and we put, you know, pressure regulator relief valves on there so we didn't get 100 PSI when we only needed 20 to run the thing because at 100 she's fairly light and doing it. That worked well for a couple of years, but oh, I just. Um... And also, be, even with we were um, like narrow window burning, we were still doing this, and we stole this idea. And, and you know, from Mark and Steve, they were doing it. Uh, Steve, Mark and Steve Day, they'd been doing it for a couple of years before we did it. And um, that was a little sprayer we used to tow behind the air seat. We used to put dual gold on straight beyond the seater, post so premium of dual. We scrapped it and modified it and um, we tied it behind the windrower and now that doesn't even, it just stays in the shed hooked up like that all year and you'll see that tomorrow if you want. But that's sort of the first step in the canola is to whack you round up your um, DST under the cutter bar and then the window, narrow window burning. Oops. And the beauty of that, 
is you're targeting this ryegrass, like these little buggers here, like look at all the seeds on that, that's not going to end up in a, it's not going to end up in a narrow window burn row, if you're narrow window burning, it won't end up in the chaff or the chaff rows, so you've got to try and stop those little fellas there as well. So when the plan comes together, and this is in canola stubble, when it works, it works especially well with canola. Like that's a great result. Clean, hot burn has done a great job. You haven't got a lot of cereal stubble either side there. Get the wind direction right, you know. Cross the row sort of slight, if you're not too much, it's fine. But when you get days like this, this is the paddock next door, the wind direction's slightly different, whoosher, the whole lot went. So there's some of the difficulties of getting the conditions right. You're trying to get more done, trying to beat the rain, conditions are hot and dry and you get a paddock like that. Some of the challenges, this was a wheat, these are two years wheat stubble, then we sowed, uh, we sowed canola into that. And it comes back to what Greg's, I think it was Greg talking about, like the stripper stubbles and the high stubble loads of that and um, keeping moisture in the system. That was about the 14th of March last year and we sowed canola straight into that when everyone was saying it's dry and it was, you know, it was very dry. But we had moisture pretty much to the surface and we managed to fluke five or ten mil on top of that. So we sowed canola a long season, winter canola into that on the 14th of March last year and it just went nuts because we just had moisture to the top, we had enough under it. But a moisture probe in that paddock and know what's going on. But so if you can imagine we've then got that level of stubble and the next year we try and do an hour window burn a canola on that. Wooshka. We're going to go straight through the fence into King A's place up the top here. Some more of the challenges of this narrow window burning has been we had a photo similar to this. Skates burn the whole paddock and beyond. Like wet free fire units in that paddock. This was actually, we were trying to burn the whole paddock. That was a um, problem stubble and we had loose drive got away in the winter last year and we wanted to grow canola, we wanted to use trefland, we did not want to burn this farm but we needed to sort of reset the slate so we burnt the farm and a bit out on the road and a few other patches. It was just, we had three fire units in that paddock. We had more than 100 metre fire back burn from this edge out into the paddock and the big sucker of a bloody whirly wing picked it up and just headed across here in the smoke and next thing I die is calling me and said, oh, you better come across. No, I think you better call the fire brigade. But anyway, we got her out. It's another smoke haze. And it's time consuming. It dries your nuts and you've got to try and get the weather right and the wind right and all these little blocks of houses have got houses next to them and you've got to all, you know, shut the house up. Some of the challenges with a narrow window burning uh, places everything in the row and that concentration of nutrients is a concern and um, loss of ground cover, like it's very bare here. It's everything there, the chaff fraction, the straw, the whole lot's in that row. Very bare, that's a bit of an aerial view from the drone. It was probably one of the times it behaved when we fly it. Uh, just very bare, not a lot of sort of ground cover and you're trying to sow into that. If you're trying to sow early crops into those sort of conditions, you struggle to get the, into that moisture to establish, you need that ground cover to establish. Um, and it's not also always successful in killing weeds, is a lot of that's even just volunteer weed in the wheat that we burnt and you've got, you know, some escapes and runs across and, um, you know, if you've got conditions where there's rain, that might be a bit wet, those rows, you've got more rain coming and it's going to keep raining, do you wait and not get a chance to burn them or you just get in and burn them and hope for the best and it doesn't work so well so when it works well it's great when it, you know at the edges of the you know sometimes it just doesn't work it's frustrating so this was sort of a eureka moment i guess we were lucky to myself and Dean fox and stephen and mal uh, went across uh greg and curly took us across to weed smart last year and caught up with peter newman and Lisa and, um, and when we went on one of the bus trips and it was sort of an eureka moment for even for us and Greg has often said this that uh, when we were in uh, Gary Lang's paddock at Wickerpen and we we're sort of sitting there and you know look, we're in the paddock and we're looking at the ryegrass here in his wheat crop and you know what do you do you've got ryegrass here you know in the chaff rows because he had an EMA chaff deck same as us and he goes Yep, we'll drop them on the tracks. We're going to do that. So we're going to harvest them. We're just going to drop them back on the tracks again. We're not spreading them back out into the paddock. So we're sort of, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. We'll go with that. So we came home and um, yeah, we're 
were talking to Mark and Steve and we said, what do we do, what do we do? And we thought, well, one in, all in, sort of, we had two headers and they had one, so we just ordered three chaff decks and loaded them all up so we could all work together if need be. And, um, yeah, so we put them on the two different headers. Um, that's the S-series with the premium power cast on there, so it's got the second discharge beater in the back, which I think is important if you're putting them onto those S-series with the sliding chopper. You need the second discharge beater in the back to keep that transitioning of the straw down to the chopper. On the older style header, the chopper position does not move when you put the chaff decks on, so you don't need that second beater. You just put your baffles in there and um, everything, straw and all the rest, still gets spread and goes through the chopper with both machines. And that's just a photo of it with the... Um, yeah, the little hood off. It's just a little conveyor mat, just like on a windrail conveyor mat or a draper front mat. Just little ones only about five or six hundred mil wide. Just one on each side and just drops half a hook, half whatever's coming off the sieves each side. So it's only yeah, only chaff concentrating that chaff. Get a little video. Considerable amount of that's in canal, so it's putting a considerable amount of just chaff, well, you know, pods and all the rest of it on the on those chaff rows, and um, yeah, there's a guy who's travelled all the way from uh, Port Lincoln, is it, in South Australia? He's come to pick up these chaff decks that we've just taken off that older model header, and he's going to take them back home with him. So he'll be a bit of an innovator down there on the Air Peninsula. So we got great into another S series, so. Rather than try and fit them up, we've got the new kit coming. So it's dropping the chaff onto the tram lines, and it's amazing how much you know material that's in lupins. You know, you've got pots and chaff and all the rest of it on there. And as Mark mentioned, they're bloody fantastic. Like this is light red country, a bit of Carajong country, some of our better stuff, and um, unreal for um, just suppressing the dust. Like it's virtually nil dust. Like the first summer spray on that. You're going to rock along there 20 k's an hour no matter how hot it's been or how dry and you don't create that dust so you're not getting that um, reduced effect for your chemicals. So that's been fantastic. You know, we're hoping it was going to be like that. It was a pretty high biomass sort of a year last year. The loop and yield here was shit house, but you know, the big bulky crop didn't yield too wet, didn't sort of set pods, but the dry matter on the on here was on the chaff rows was growing. Tram lines. That was last year. That was, they're a pretty hostile environment, so nothing against the, the chaff lines, a single chaff line, but because we have um, tram lines, because they've mostly been bare historically, because we drive on them, we destroy them, we wreck them, we renovate them, we drive on them again, it's just a good spot for us, for our system, to put the, to put the chaff out here on these tracks. <coughs> but that was just, we shouldn't talk about last year. So when I started doing this, is this where I come up with this stupid thought of it? We're basically weed lining. So we're spraying three sets of tram tram lines in a pass with this rocket here. It's the actual um, what was the burner, and we've converted it now. So we have one nozzle here, one here, one on each of these rows, and out here. So we're we're picking up all three pairs or all six of them in one pass. So we're still effectively doing 36 metres in a run. And um, we're just spraying that thing. So when you run one nozzle over one chaff row, it works out to about 8% of the area of the paddy. So that was basically me experimenting, but I was actually out there just targeting volunteer cereal wheat. So, you know, you might have been out there, say with a weeded spray and that, just spot spraying 8% of the paddock of these little wheat plants where, you know, dot all around the paddock. I'm doing it with an old has-been thing that we didn't spend a lot of money on, and I'm doing it in weed lines. You know, I've spent no money on that old rocket, so the raw ram, just a little linkage tank. So we just started playing with that idea. So that was actually the first knockdown um, sort of summer spray. It was only the wheel tracks. They've just had a bit more moisture and germinated, and that's the same sort of thing. It's only like a 600 litre tank on there. On control traffic, just rock along. you just got one nozzle here targeting this little tram line. One here, the same again. It's just, just a crazy thought. 
ideally down the track and everyone you talk to has had the chaff digs for a while, the build up of chaff and the rotting and the self sort of attrition is it and they start to rot down and die will be better but we've sort of obviously just gone bang, here's an environment where there's no competition and they've just stuck their heads up and they're pretty obvious the weeds so that's why I didn't want to just harvest them and put them back there, I wanted to reduce the numbers on those chaff lines this year if I could. And that's back to that previous couple of photos and that's, yeah, that's probably not so much, it is a mess, but if I've got to go out around the tree, I have, I've just got to go out around the tree, I can't spray that because I'll hit the tree obviously with that um, little single nozzle, but that just shows you the effect and like, the paddock's reasonably clean, very clean, a bit of volunteer wheat going out the back, so, and off the char fraction, trying to keep it from going out on the, on the rotor there. Right, just trying to chuck it. I'm not going too hard, I probably just a bit snoozy there and didn't have the header set up properly, but anyway. Couldn't chuck that much out. Burning the stuff on this farm on this soil type is the worst thing to do, but we worried about the iliopathic effect. Well, the loose strife to grow a canola crop there this year, so we just nuked it all. But we noticed how these wind rows, these um Chaff rows, how they'll smoulder and thought, oh geez, they're burning well. And a nice little cross breeze and thought, yeah, they're doing a good job. And you kick them open and they, they were just chaff to the ground and weed seeds and everything. Just, and that was a, that fire went off like a bomb. It was hot. So it's just not enough air in the chaff rows to burn and the smoulder. And that was dry conditions and good conditions. And we were more concerned trying to keep it in the paddock. You could see from an earlier photo. Because um, we wanted to make trefline on that paddock, and we because that was just burnt and basically straight in behind it, we were trying to sow that. That's the sowing tractor there now, but the day before, that was basically Dyer's job. Grab the tractor and arrows, it's on CDFs, you just roar up and down there and just dust the, the ash in just to get rid of it to get the best effect of the trefline if we were going to do that on this farm. And you can just see all that unburnt chaff and presumably weed seeds are in there, so the, the, burning the Chaff rose doesn't look like it's an option, which is fantastic. That's a paddock. If you come on the bus trip tomorrow, that's just down from our house and out from the sheds. And that's the, um, so that was second year cereal last year, which is the last time we're trying that stunt, unless the paddocks are exceptionally clean. And just the level of ryegrass. Like we've cleaned it up reasonably well in through here, and we've dumped it on that track, and it's just fell. And you know, this paddock was the one that was just too wet last year. It was underwater and it was just a disaster from the wet, the wheat struggle, the wheat drown, the ryegrass flourish. Another one of the reasons, these sort of paddocks were the reasons where we had to do something, and that's why the chaff decks came along. And it is surprising and encouraging, as you can see, just how much ryegrass is on those chaff rows to show you what you're capturing. If you do that for a couple of years, reduce those numbers and dump the little buggers here and do something with them or let them rot down, you're going to start to have a bit of a win. That's what we're hoping. Back to this weed line. So this is on our little spray coop. So triple X nozzles, you can rotate them around and just dial up whichever one. <coughs> whichever ones you want. So I've just got an 025 on here. But actually I'm really running an 025 here on, um, and then an 025 here on 50mm spacings. And because it's on 250, I've just turned that one on in the middle as well, just for more coverage. So that's one nozzle, that's really two nozzles. So that's really doing sort of 16% of the paddock when you run two nozzles, and that one's extra just to make sure I drown them. I was putting on about 180 litres of water per hectare there. It was really probably, it was a bit experimental too, but it was probably too early to start um, spraying the rest of the paddock. It was one to two relief ryegrass. And these were sort of two to three and pretty feral on these wheel tracks. So they got 500 mils of clethid in before the frosts. And this we were going to wait a week or 10 days for the frost to go and then have a go at the paddock. And we had to wait five weeks and we still had no frost free period for the clethid in. So we just had to spray it and had a slightly reduced effect. Uh, the weed lining. So that's been sown to wheat in the canola stubbles. And you can see that, you know, that's already had Roundup and Striker and uh, yeah, really be ran up and striker over this paddock and probably Dyron, ran up striker and Dyron. Tim loves his Dyron, so do we. Um, yeah, volunteer canola and ryegrass from the chaff rows. And so we sprayed these chaff lines only with that three point linkage rig, so we only did 8% of the padding. So the rest of the block out there, we were using a brew of uh, Secura, two litres of Gramoxone as the double knockdown, and low ground just on these. Actually, we didn't use low ground on the rest of the paddock. We only used Gramoxone Secura on the paddocks. We 
We used Chromoxone to cure it and added some low green for some activity on these little fellows here as much as anything. And um, yeah, so a blank of brew would have been 48 bucks a hectare. And so because we're only doing 8% of the paddock, you got it down to $3.85. Like that's, you know, you start talking weed type capabilities we're targeting those weeds. Uh, that's a share, it's a newly acquired share farming paddock this year, although we did contract harvest that one last year and didn't realise we were going to get it. So, um, and you've got volunteer canola there in, that, um, in those rows, in the chaff deck rows, and um, that's what you would have had, well, that's what we would have had all, on all our canals if we didn't just whack that little weed line or over it or something to control those. So on our main boom spray here, it's a dual line, so we run 015s on the front line, we run 025s on the back line, but on the chaff rows, the 025s we were replaced when we, no, 02, sorry, the 02s have been replaced with an 025. So we're using our second line most of the time, so we're actually getting 25% more applied to the chaff rows. So if you're using 400 mils of clethidine, across the boom, you're effectively applying the full labour rate of 500 mils of clethidim on the chaff rows. Uh, the wee line, well, I was out there one morning, it's pretty rare for me to be up early enough to see a frost, I like to not see frost.